Okay, so I'd like to start uh, by reading out of the book of Revelation. And what I, one of the things I want you to walk away with, a, a key idea, and uh, repeat after me, Revelation is weird. weird. One more time with more feeling. Revelation is weird. weird. Totally. Now we're all on the same page because Revelation is weird. It is weird. It is it is what is known as anomalous as a book. It stands alone. Anomalous means alone, esoteric. There is nothing else that's like it. It uh, has no uh, other component to it, really, in Scripture. And we'll get into that, but I, I want to open us in prayer. Then I'm going to read from Revelation, and uh, then, we'll, then we'll dive into how to read the Bible for all it's worth, chapter 13. Heavenly Father, I ask for your guidance today. I pray that you would give me favor as I try to share. I pray that you would give us hearing and ears to hear as we listen and as we hear from the pages of our text, but most importantly, as we, we hear from the pages of your scripture. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to dive into your word today. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. 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 So I'm going to read from the prologue of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 1, and I'll read through verse 3. And I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Imagine that. Amen. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, I want to make note of that. Everything he saw. This is his report of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then the best stuff. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. For the time is a long way off. Is that what your Bible says? No, it is near. And so John must have been totally mistaken when he wrote that, that the time is near. Except that Scripture is true. Because God doesn't keep track of time the way we keep track of time. And the, the thing is, is that it is near on God's time. The book of Isaiah tells us that a thousand years is like a, a day to God. A thousand of our years is like a day to God. So Jesus was, was resurrected the day before yesterday. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> He was, Jesus was resurrected the day before yesterday. So is it a long time for God? No. Is it right that, that John should write the word near and mean it? Yes. And is it right that this book is written in a weird way? It's weird because of all sorts of things. But one of which is, it's written in the way that you could read it and look at the newspaper and put them side by side and go, hey, I think I see some similarities. <laughs> it's written so that as a Christian reads the pages of Revelation, they may be sitting comfortably in their chair, but as they read the pages of Revelation, they move further and further to the edge of their seat until you're like, wow, this is right on the edge. And in fact, my favorite this, this, uh, book commentary on Revelation is titled Discipleship on the Edge. It's Discipleship on the Edge. I love it. It's really great. It holds such a, an open-handed view of Revelation. It's weird because I know people who would not talk to each other anymore because of the way they interpreted and understood Revelation. Churches have divided over it. Families have divided over it because of the way that they understand and view Revelation. You can't possibly be right because my way's right. 
that's the way it's kind of been behaved, you know? And, uh, and so then we got all of these terms. It's weird because it, it causes people to, to create all these terms. What are you? Are you a pre-mill, ah-mill, post-mill, mid-trib, pre-trib, post-trib, anti-disestablishmentarianism trib? All these crazy terms, and we're fighting over them. Are you a premillennialist, a, a postmillennialist, a, a mid-millennialist? I, I, I am a pan-millennialist, because it's all going to pan out in the end. No matter what your version, then this is where I'm operating tonight. I'm hopefully going to step on some of your toes, because some of our preconceived notions myself included, have been wrong about Revelation. We need humility when we enter into the Scripture reading. Humility that the Holy Spirit might guide us, and that people, as they have prepared uh, commentaries, have thought about this deeply, can help inform us. But ultimately, we, we use humility as we go to the text. And Revelation is no uh, exception of that. And so I, I say I'm a pan-millennialist. I'm kind of talking, you know, tongue-in-cheek, but I think it's all going to pan out in the end. Because no matter what you believe, if it's not the way I believe, but you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Amen. we will end in the same place, which is in the presence of God. Amen. If your version of Revelation is wrong, then you're still going to go to heaven. Right? Okay, so we're not going to argue over this, but we're going to try and understand it. Because it's weird, we just don't know. And so the, the approach to Revelation, it, it's, it's intriguing. It's, um, when I was a, a youth pastor, and I would give a, a, um, a, a survey at the beginning of every school year, hey, you know, well, not every school year, but a lot of them, I would say, hey, what do you want to study? And always at the top of the, of the list was this weird book called Revelation. Every student I ever knew, at some, in some way or another, wanted to study Revelation. Now, were you, were you ever in that camp, intrigued by Revelation? Definitely, definitely. Any of you f so freaked out by it that it scares you and you don't want to read it? Anybody? No one's going to cop to that? Come on, that freaks people out. It's, it's weird. It's, it's weird. And I'm going to jump to the middle of our chapter and pull it out a little bit more, tease it out a little bit more, and I'm going to tell you what I think the theme and the purpose for Revelation is, is to teach us to do two things. Could you potentially look at my board that I've written and tell what I think the central themes of Revelation is? Well, that's weird, yeah, but no, can, you, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, suffer and wait! That is exactly what Revelation, John is writing to the church. The occasion that John is writing, remember, we, we're going we're gonna to do some of that today. You know, it's, it's, we need to think about the, uh, the uh, occasion because the nature of Revelation is that it's an apocalypse, it's a prophecy, and it's an epistle, it's a letter. And we, what did we learn about epistles? We want to know what the occasion, what was the circumstances under which John was writing. And he was writing to a whole bunch of people that were, were uh, suffering persecution. There was a lot of persecution. John himself, uh, history tells us, was uh, on the island of Patmos as a result of persecution. Some fairly reliable sources tell us that John was not just poured oil over him, but he was dipped in boiling oil as a way to martyr him, and he didn't die. And so he recovered, and they put him on the island of Pat Patmos, and he had this, these visions, right? And it's very interesting to me that in the very beginning of the book, and I highlighted it when I read it, John did not share what he heard. He shared what he... It's what he saw. He's sharing things that he saw. And the Holy Spirit jumps in there and does this really cool thing, which is get right what he saw that he would write down so that we could have it. Because one of the things about uh, 
eyewitnesses in any trial, what you see is uh, open to interpretation or is not always reliable. You can have three or four witnesses to the same event and they'll all tell you a different story, right? And, and the other implication is, is that this is what John saw, and so that's why our chapter, when we read about it, deals so much with the word picture. It's talking about the pictures and the images that we see in Revelation. It's because John is using words to tell us what he saw. And so it's sort of, it's sort of different than any of the prophets. You know, when we talk about prophecy, the prophets are writing down what God tells them to write down because of what they, what they heard. And so that tells you something about Revelation. It's weird. And the occasion that John is writing is that there's this persecution happening. And so he writes this book so that the people would understand that he's telling them how to suffer and how to wait. It's a how-to book. Having read Revelation, would you have ever concluded that? Of course you wouldn't. You're a Westerner born in, uh, in the 20th century or thereafter. How could you possibly understand the book of Revela the Revelation if we're so far removed? Because it's weird. It's written as an apocalypse. That's the first category of the nature of the book of Revelation. It's apocalypse. It, that's a weird thing. It's, it's, uh, the language is off the charts different. They're intense. The descriptions are intense. I don't mean camping. Mm -hmm. Intense. intense. <laughs> Thank you for the rim shot. Thank you for the rim shot. I had you there, and then I had to wait. We've got to lighten it up a little bit. But it's, it's um, the, the, the images are there to impact you. Just, just like language can impact you when you use the type of, it, depending on what type of language you use, depending on what sort of intonation your voice has. It's one of my, this is an aside, I'm not going to charge extra for this, but one of my pet peeves as a pastor is when someone is reading about, let's say, what we just came through. You know, someone stands up and, and reading the, uh, the resurrection narrative, one of them, and they're like, and so Mary ran to the uh, tomb, and um, the tomb was empty. <laughs> right? There's exclamation points all in the text, but they're reading it like, ho oh, hum, I went and got a candy bar, and you know, it was all right. And it's, that's it. Jesus was risen from the dead! <laughs> We use intonation that way. We use language that way. We use punctuation that way. John is using images that way. Okay? So I knew I had to boil this down a lot, and there's all this stuff that's going on in the chapter, but the reason the stuff is so weird, first of all, John wants us to think about the Old Testament. It, you know, there's echoes of the Old Testament. His, his, the people he's writing to, are pretty much most of them are aware of the Old Testament, and they're aware of Old Testament apocalypse, which we find in like Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah, Zechariah. What am I forgetting? Some of Psalms. Uh, Psalm one. Daniel. As I said Daniel, but yes. Joshua. Daniel is he leading heavily in, in Revelation, but uh, so is Zechariah and Ezekiel. But anyway, I digress. So he's wanting the people to kind of get themselves grounded in the truth of the Lord. They know the Old Testament, and he's kind of quoting them, but applying them in a new way, or an, in an ultimate way. And as weird as Revelation is, there is some language in apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament that it's relying on. So it's not as weird to the original audience. And that's why, I, why am I saying that? Because the occasion for him writing is he's trying to put people's minds at ease. And the reason he's writing in such a weird way is because it's language that they know. It's just not language that we, you and I know. It, it, it doesn't compute for us. And so the apocalypse side of it is hard. And, and the, the prophecy side of it is even harder because if, if we use this prophecy thing, and we, when we think about the apocalyptic literature of Revelation, and we say the word prophecy, we think future fulfillment. 
But if we jump down here under the hermeneutics part, much of what the Revelation describes as yet to be already happened. A lot of Revelation that is yet to be has already happened. It's centering around Rome and, and what was going on there. And, and I, I can already feel it. It's, it's stepping on people's toes a little bit. We, we want to put the whole thing as it's everything means something in the future. It's just simply not true. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of a piece of apocalyptic literature, particularly the weird book of Revelation and what it's describing. Now, does, did I say everything is, is, has already happened? Uh, this word right here says much. And some of the things that has already happened might, in fact, have another application in the future, but we have to be super, super, super careful about how we might apply that. If we're sure that, hey, this thing that John writes about was fulfilled um, in uh, the Roman period, if we're going to take that and say that's going to be a, there's going to be an ultimate fulfillment in the future, we better be, we better be extra, extra sure. And I I have studied scripture in the original languages and everything a whole lot of my life. I, I'm, not as, I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, amen. I like that second. That's Robert's Rules. All in favor? <laughs> right? Amen. <laughs> but I have studied this for a long, long time. And, you know, there's just a, a, a bunch of it that I'm not willing to, uh, you know, I'm not going to die for it. I'm just not. I'm, I, I'm around other Christians who are seemingly ready to die because they know. And I just don't see that that, I don't see that's, I don't see that that's uh, an approach that you can really stand on. That we want to hold this in more tension than that. Now, I, what, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that God isn't absolutely orchestrating everything according to his plan. It's just I'm telling you, you don't know it as well as you think you do right? We know the ultimate part, you know, Revelation 21, 22, that stuff we know. We know the final battle is going to be won after the armies are amassed against the, the, the Son of God. And we read in Scripture that of all the armies that have amassed in their evil plans and plotted, they're foiled by the Word of God. Because as we see the rider on the horse, what comes out of his mouth? A sword. The sword is always, always, always the word of God. So the enemy is defeated by the truth. Isn't that, doesn't he get tingle in that? Can you hear that? Yeah. The enemy is so easily defeated and God is so powerful that truth is what defeats him. And their lies can't handle the truth. In that instance, uh, Jack Nicholson was right. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> right? And so the book of Revelation is weird. There are certain little pieces and pockets. I think the book did, did a really great job of, of talking about um, certain aspects of the context that we just aren't going to get. They're just so weird, we have to look at a commentary, and you really sh should read several of them to try and, and get a feel for what Revelation is trying to say. Um, there, there are a couple of, of those uh, images that are in there that are confounding. We just can't figure out their meaning. Uh, and I think that it's not critical to the main, the big idea uh, of, uh, of the scripture. Uh, I'm referring to the historical context. Isn't it comforting to know that our same, as weird as it is, our same rules apply? Read the whole thing. Read for the big picture. Understand as much as you can sort of what the whole thing is saying. Because it's an apocalypse and a pro, it's a prophecy, but ultimately also it's an epistle. Isn't it comforting to read those pages in our text where it says, hey, all of the hallmarks and earmarks of a letter at the time of John, they're all in there. It's like any one of the Ians from Paul. Thessalonians, Ephesians, Galatians. It's a formal letter. 
you know, there's a greeting, there's a salutation, there's thanksgiving, there's all these things at the beginning, and then he ends in the same way. So ultimately, Revelation is just the last epistle. I mean, technically speaking, it's the final epistle because it's a letter. And it's written to seven churches that are listed there. And uh, it's, it's intended to help them suffer so that they might persevere to the end, which is another word for wait, right? And so, um, and I'm not here to, um, I'm not here to move you onto my way of thinking and approach to what Revelation is. I, I hope that I can make you a pan, a pan millennialist or a pan revelationist and that it's, it's going to all pan out in the end and the details of how it's going to work are up to God. But we want to know how best to wait as to what Revelation tells us, how to wait, because it's, the kingdom is already here, but it's not yet. And that's, that's why John can say it's near, because the end times, specifically as Scripture describes the end times and when you end times is one of the we love to talk about the end times right yeah. well the end is near that's john saying end times well from scripture standpoint end times is everything from basically the cross until jesus returns mm-hmm. and because the the cross inaugurated the end times you know what inauguration is we do that every four years and so uh, it inaugurated, it started, it set in motion the final coming back of Jesus where heaven and earth will come together, there'll be one. The fulfillment of Jesus' prayer that we read in the Gospels, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Revelation 22 is describing. That is the fulfillment, the final fulfillment of Jesus' prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When heaven comes down to earth and the two are one, Jesus' prayer is fulfilled. And ultimately, that's what you and I want to focus on. Now, if you want to focus on, oh, the church is raptured out and it's this and it's that, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll share some of my, my beliefs, but man, I really don't care. If you're the exact opposite of me and the way you read Revelation, I will sing praises next to you in church every day of my life and be just fine. How about you? Amen. Amen. So so if you start to say, well, I don't know, I don't know if it's going to end the way the Bible says and what God intends, then we have a problem. Because when when heaven is here on earth, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's the end. That's a primary deal. I think a lot of the details that people get all hung up over in Revelation is just actually secondary. And I don't even know if it's secondary. I would consider a lot of it tertiary, which is third level and beyond, right? It's tertiary. It's way out there. And if, if I believe we're here through the rapture, there is no rapture, but we're here through all the tribulation, and I'm wrong, and you're right that there is a rapture, man, I'll find you in the air and look for a high five and say, man, am I glad you were right. <laughs> But if the shotgun is pointed at your head and you realize the tribulation is, is a part of what we're about and you're looking at me and going, oh my goodness. So I'm a pragmatist where that's concerned. I think we're here through the worst of it. You know? But I'm willing to be wrong, much to the contrary of what my kids think about me. I'm willing to be wrong. I'll admit I'm wrong. Well, Jeannie's like, yeah, no, you won't. <laughs> so... So I think this chapter gives us such a central uh, look at it. He, he, they don't get in the weeds at all, you know. And there's, a, there's some points where he tells us, the author tells us, hey, some of this is so weird, we're just not really sure. You're going to have to uh, look at some commentaries. And, um, and, and, then, and then maybe make your decision. But ultimately, it doesn't have eternal consequence whether or not you're headed to heaven or, or whether heaven will be here on earth, whether it's eternal or not, I think that's all clear in Scripture, right? And, and there's, there's 
I mean, who's in and who's out? The judgment piece, the sheep and the goats, you see that? There's a lot of that language in there. There are those who are the sheep and there are those that are the goats. There's a division uh, judgment seat that we read about in Scripture. And you're either a sheep or you're a goat. There's no shoats <laughs> or geeps. You know, it's one or the other. It's, it's, it's A or not A, right? Um, and that, that's difficult for a world that wants to live in the gray, that wants to find the fence and walk the fence. Well, there is no fence. There's just a razor-thin point at the top, and you're going to fall on one side or the other, and it's up to you whether you, you accept the call and receive Christ or you don't. I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, digital that way. It's a one or a zero. And, and so that's a difficult message for the world, though, isn't it? Right? That's a, di that's a difficult message for me. The, the thought of not everyone being a sheep is tough. Um, but that ultimately is not up. You're very ill. Yes, I am. So is Christ. So I, it's not up to me. That, that decision is, up, is not up to me, and I'm thankful. I'd be a lousy judge. I'd be a lousy judge. So would you. <clears throat> so Christians don't pronounce whether you think someone's in or out. Be a fruit inspector, but don't pronounce their eternal uh, destination. Pray for them to be eternally a sheep and behave that way, right? And so all of this stuff is important. We want to we learn how to suffer and wait because the key end in discipleship is martyrdom. It is. It's dying to self, isn't it? Martyrdom is the key to discipleship in Christ. We're to die, right? Dying to self. That's pretty, that's pretty significant language. And the book of Revelation is saying, look, in this season that we live, here's how you wait. Here's how you die. Here's how you die to self. And, and I would say um, there is physical death, but there is only one death in your life, not two. Right? That's the difference between a sheep and a goat. A sheep dies once. A goat dies twice. Physically and spiritually. It's death to be separated from God. Who's in it again? Why would they make the death the Martyrdom is the, is the only end. That's the, that's the end. That's the goal of discipleship. Um, but it's, it's die to self and potentially die to physical self. But that's up to, that's up to um, time and the Lord. So... Uh, but they can kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Right? Yeah. So um, I lost something of what I was going to say there. Uh, one more thing, and then we were going to hit, hit small groups. Um, uh, oh, here it is. It's right here, and it's in blue. Okay. I'm, I'm going to finish with this. It's not an account of the future. Uh, ultimately, it's not an account of the future. It's an account of how to suffer and wait in the present, right? And there's some future things in there, but they're only given to you so that you can deal with today, right? And, and the problem that some of us as Christians in the past, nobody here, of course, have had this problem, right? None of us have had this problem, but some Christians have been so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. That's an old saying. Some of you who are younger in this room have no idea of that saying, but, but uh, it's one that's been around a long time. You're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Uh, that means be, be salty and be light filled in this, in this life as you're, as you're walking today in the right now, right? It, rather than putting blinders on and going, I've got my salvation, you know? I, 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 I want... I want to bring as many people along with me as I possibly can, right? And I, I, it's not my job to save them. Whose job is that? Are you a failure if nobody comes to Christ around you? No. 
Are you a failure if you never talk about your faith to anyone? Yes. I, I, I said this at a men's, this is where I'm going to finish. I said this at a men's breakfast many moons ago. It was the first time that I ever taught anything in this church. I said, if you're not discipling someone, I, I wonder about your faith. Amen. I wonder whether or not you're actually listening to the Spirit or do you have access to the Holy Spirit because you're, you're shutting him off then. God, God is so clear that he wants you to wait by discipling others. And I would, I, I would bring up Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, make lots of friends and wait on me. That's what it says, right? No, it doesn't. It says, make disciples. And the way you do that, tell them everything you know about me. Tell, teach them everything you know. Just tell them everything. And then baptize them and tell them to do the same thing. That's how it gets multiplication rather than addition. It gets geometric then. It gets exponential. All those math words. We're mathing here. And so it's not about a book about the future. It's a book about today and how to, how to live today. And so it is, it is 7.06. I'll see you at 7.36 where we'll reconvene and we'll argue about Revelation and uh, leave mad at each other. How about that? Okay. Ready, break. See you at 736. Okay. Let's, uh, let's pick back up again. If, if I may, I wanted to uh, pull a couple things back together here. Um, Necessity of exegesis, where it speaks of the analogies of Scripture, we have to be careful about that. Uh, because Revelation is so weird, because it is so al standing alone, there aren't a lot of analogous things within the rest of Scripture that we can really use. And so um, if, you, if you couple that with the fact that there are a lot of added difficulties, there's like five things that he lists in there that are added difficulties. It's a result of the fact that there's different kinds of images. There's a rich background that John is writing from that we need to take into account and understand. Uh, the rich background, it, it, we can find out what that rich background is in places like the videos that I linked to for the resources. Aren't they great? Uh, so they're great. The, the two that are the part one and part two of Revelation helps you sort of understand the background of it. And then the other one that talks about apocalyptic literature and uh, the strangeness that that is. Um, that's an added difficulty because, you know, it's so far from us. But if we look at there's not a lot of analogies within other parts of Scripture that we can use as a key to uh, try to unlock what John's saying. Um, the added difficulties are that we need to pay attention to the points where John does an image or a picture that he gives us and then interprets it for us. That we can use as a way to sort of understand and use that as, a, as a, uh, almost a Rosetta Stone for some of the rest of Revelation. So Rosetta Stone, do we understand that, re that reference? Yeah, okay. I'm always wondering when I throw something out there if everyone's with me and uh, I probably should have said this more often. If I lose you, raise your hand and go, dude, where are you right now? So, so uh, the added difficulties, I, I just wanted to highlight that again and realize that John does give us interpretation of some of the pictures he gives us and some of the images that he gives us. And those are the places that, that smart and biblical uh, commentators use to, to help them understand other places within Scripture, uh, within that Scripture. Um, so he'll give us an image, he'll give us an interpretation, much, much very helpful, but, then, but it only kind of can help us suggest some things that are going on. And one of the other pieces that is an added difficulty for me is that, um, how would I say this in Tom speak? Everything doesn't mean something. Like the number of eyes, the number of horns, the number of wings, whether it's flying, whether it's on the ground, it's this means this and this means this. That's the kind of understanding I 
kind of came up with. I remember when I first, I've referenced this, but I remember the first time I happened onto that little book called Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Man, I couldn't sleep for a month. Like it freaked me out a little bit, a lot of it. And it, that, how, how could I read this revelation and not see these things? And it, it breaks one of the first rules of exegesis and the necessity of exegesis is that nowhere is, is revelation up there sh saying that it's an allegory. It's not an allegory. So not everything means something. That there are these stark pictures, much like, here we go again, much like hyperbole, much like similes, much like metaphors, those, those, they're devices to try and point us to a bigger understanding and move us in a direction. But when he's talking about these beasts and the horns and all of that, um, it's everything doesn't have a meaning. But it's, it's more of an impactful picture. Um, it's an impactful picture? Yeah. 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 And, and um, when, you, when you understand sort of like the big idea that John, when you start to figure out what the big idea might be that John is sharing, and you, just, you can just stop there, you know? But I, I, I've often asked myself, why do we push the text further than it ought to be pushed, do you think? It's a thirst for knowledge, exactly what I think it is. We push the text further than it ought to be pushed, and we say things like, you know, well, this means uh, this is Russia and this is America, and, you know, and, and it doesn't work. It, it's a, a fundamental misunderstanding of an ancient piece of literature. When it says there's 144,000, does it really mean 144,000 people? No, it means a whole bunch of people. When it says that it's a thousand year reign, does it mean a literal thousand years? No, no. But the, the number thousand for someone in John's era would have looked at that and went, that's a long time. That's what it means. It doesn't mean a literal thousand years, it means a, a long time. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really trying to say the perfect number of people will be in heaven because it'll be exactly who God says. That's why the 144,000, it's 12 twelves, whatever, you know? And, and, and the 12 is a big number, 10 is a big number, 7 is a big number, 3 is a big number. They, they just mean God is at work, he's orchestrating, it's going to be exactly as he says it will be, and it will be perfect. But to say it's 144,000, I hope not. I hope God's math is bigger than that. Right, but there are those who believe that's what it says, right? Which, yikes. So, what about the dimensions of the city? It's 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles cubed. Again, big, big numbers that are perfect means that heaven will be perfect. It's not exact. It's not, everything doesn't mean something. It just means it's going to be exact. Now, if I'm wrong about that, I think you have a lot of scripture to answer for if you're saying it's something more than that, right? So that's why I'm an amillennialist. I think the millennial is, millennium is a long time, and I think we're in it right now. I did find in the book the author's explanation of what it means. Okay. And it says, the primary meaning of Revelation is what John intended it to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's a get out of jail free card right there. It, the primary meaning is what John intended it to be. That's a mic drop right there. Yeah, yeah. Even if your name is not Mike, you can drop. Yeah, I think that's hilarious. That's good, good work. That's good work right there. Yeah, so I, I, I just think we're, we're all sort of, how do we, I ask myself this question in church, in scripture, in studying scripture, in trying to help teach scripture, how do we, how do we, how do I, let me just put it to me, how do I appropriately divorce myself from the culture and the word usage and the language that I've grown up with in a way that I cannot be inhibited from understanding what scripture is trying to say, right? And, and 
in Revelation, because I said it's an epistle, it can't mean something that it couldn't have meant to them in that day, right? Now, it can, it can start, it can give them a little something that they only see like through a glass darkly, but it's, but it's true, it's real. It just will have a, a greater fulfillment than anyone could imagine, right? Like Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, God will do immeasurably more than, than anything you could ever ask or imagine, right? So I, I think there are so many... Revelation, probably because it is so weird, has more challenges to trying to understand it and not make it more than it actually is, not, not force it to be more than it actually is. And we're, we're fighting that. I mean, am I making the case well enough that it's like, man, there's, there's a lot we have to unlearn before we can learn from Scripture, which, again, I'm going to loop back to why I like discipleship on the edge as a commentary. If, if you've ever read a commentary and you feel like, man, that ran right over my head, you, you'd love discipleship on the edge because it's, it's sort of like the author writes a letter to you about how much God loves you through the book of Revelation. It is a love letter to you to help you suffer and wait because, you know, ultimately life is just a crap sandwich and every day is a new bite. Until Jesus comes back, and man, it was worth the wait. Yeah, let me encourage you with that, right? <laughs> if you've ever read the book of Job, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, and it's hogwash. No. Okay. Fair enough. I wasn't thinking Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The Word of God. He gives a clear understanding of the Word of God. You have people who think what they think because, you know, this is how their mind works. They, yeah. You know, the culture they live in, they read certain books. But the Holy Spirit of God is the one who ultimately teaches us when you give yourself over to be taught by Him. By yep. Him. Yeah. So the question is, who has that? Okay, and is it available to every every believer, every follower of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Right. So I think I think revelation when the Holy Spirit gives insight is is much like um, it's an elusive clarity. Like it's there and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. Because our own our own thoughts intrude. So we, we have that in we have that in fits and starts. So, and I think that the Holy Spirit will illuminate us only as much as we need, not as much as we want. So I think that's where I, that's how I would explain Revelation. The, the Holy Spirit will illuminate enough truth for you to hang on and wait in, an, in a very appropriate and biblical way and, and endure suffering in a way that honors him. I, I, beyond that, who has the right one? I think, I think Jesus, that's my answer, that's my Sunday school answer. Who has the right interpretation of Revelation? Jesus. And I think we're all going to be a little incorrect, which is why I'm trying to express humility as I'm talking about this. Why I talk about, hey, if you're right, I'm going to high-five you in the air. Um, I just, that's the way I live with it. I, I want to hold it with humility and ask good questions, ask hard questions of one another. Um, I, 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 that's, I, is that answer it at all for you? Not, not, not as full as you want, maybe, but. Yeah. Look, if, if all these people say the end of, you know, Christ is coming back today, at some point someone's going to be right. Eventually someone's going to be right. <laughs> right. Amen. That's exactly what I thought about Hal Lindsey when he came out with his revision. After the date that he said Jesus was going to come back didn't happen, he rewrote it and said, oh, I was mistaken. Yes, you were, and you were mistaken again. So even Christ doesn't know the day he's coming back. Yes. I have a question. Yes. So um, how do you know, like, the morning when you, how do you see it, or is it just what how it happens? I think that's just a picture that's trying to tell you there's a fierceness 
to what this world is. There's the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth and all of those things. I think that's just, I think it's to get your attention. I think it's to um, get you thinking about the, that there is, ultimately I think those kinds of images point to a truth. And that is that there's a reality behind what you see and what you, what you experience in the physical world. There is something coming from beyond, you know? And I think part of what John saw was that God peeled back reality and let him see what was behind and underneath the physical world and what was smell, hear, see, touch. Okay? And so I think he used the only language he had to describe what he was seeing. And I, th- I think, it, I think it's, as, it's as intense as it can be so that it leaves an impression on you. Yep, impactful. Yeah, and second question? Um, Brian, how do you know when you hear a loud noise in the like We'll know, yeah, yep. It's, it's like when they say you'll know when you fall in love, you'll know. Yeah. <laughs> you'll know. You just, you become an idiot. You can't think of anyone else. <laughs> I'm looking over there. Yeah, so you'll know. I don't think, no one will wonder what it is, even people who don't follow Jesus. I think they'll be aware. And, it, and it'll be a thing where everybody's going to succumb to the truth. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yep. No, you're good. Go ahead. Yep. No, I just, just, I just you know, pick back what you were saying. It's just, you know, you know Mighty says you're going to hear it, you can hear it, period. No yep. matter who you are. Yeah, which is why. Time is time, and you're all going to hear it. Which is why Paul says, hey, don't worry that if you missed it. You know, when he's writing to the Thessalonians, that's a major reason the occasion why he's writing in Thessalonians is because there's a whole group of people in Thessalonica who were listening to a false teaching that said, oh, Jesus came back, you missed it. And he's like, oh, no, here, let me give you some signs. Here's, here's some ways to read the road signs, and you know whether you're in Kansas, Toto, and no one's going to mistake it you'll not be wondering whether Jesus is announcing that he's coming back. And that, that's, that's the point. Is it an actual trumpet blast? I don't know. No one will mistake what it is, I'll tell you that. We'll all go, oh, that's the trumpet blast. Got it. Let's go. Right. Yeah, Yeah, because some pretty freaky stuff happened when Jesus died on the cross. Like a bunch of people got resurrected. How did, what? No one talks about that. Come on now. And the, the sky, there were, there were celestial responses to the, to the spiritual thing that was happening, the theological thing that was happening. So the same will be true. Yeah. Well, you can, you can believe it, but you can you not accept it. Because I think Satan believes that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Yeah. Believing it. You know, as I always give students, the, the Satan test is the ultimate test. If Satan can believe it, is that enough to be saved? No. You know, no, it's not. He, the, the difference is G, Satan will never bend his knee to Jesus. Satan will never bend his knee to Jesus. He will never succumb to the truth, which is that Jesus is the Savior. Yeah. So, uh, any other questions? We got. Wait, I, I'm sorry. You, you, you've had. A, we can maybe talk afterwards. I want to take some other ones. Okay, hang on. No, they saw him. Charlie, what you doing here? I thought you died. That's exactly what happened. The language there is that there was a resuscitation of dead bodies. I, it's crazy. Well, yeah, I think they lived until they died again, just like Lazarus. Yeah. 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 
They were resuscitated, they weren't resurrected, so I used the wrong term. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, because resurrected is, a, is what Jesus got, which was an eternal body that is, is forever. Yeah, sinless, doesn't break down. Isn't that going to be great? Yes. Other, other points to ponder? Yep. Yeah. Oil or Trim your wick. Or yep. Yep. Endure those final days and yep. be ready to enter. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's really the um, that's uh, that's a good place to jump off to to maybe one of my final thoughts and why I I'm a you know I'm we're here till the end is because that's really the full fuller sense of how the scriptures talk about suffering and tribulation. It's that God never, never plucks people out of suffering, really. He just is with them in the midst of it, you know. Um, but that's okay if, if that happens that way. I was wrong, and I'll tell you immediately. I'll tell you immediately. Um, but I think that, that the way God saves is going to be final when Jesus comes and earth is here on, heaven is here on earth, I'm sorry. And how that all plays out in the, in the end is just, I don't know. It'll work out. It'll pan out. Thank you. It'll pan out. And I think that we could debate offline your particular take on it. I, I would be happy to have a conversation with you as long as you promise me. And the end, we hug and we're friends. Right? Because that, I just won't do it otherwise. I've, I've done it wrong too many times. And one of the things that recovery tells you is I'm not going to try it again the same way. That's right. Come on now. Insanity. That's it. That's insanity. Yeah, Hal, did you have a, a point to ponder? Insanity. Yeah. I'm just hoping you're judging. Yeah. Say that someday we're going to judge angels. We're going to judge angels? Yeah. Somehow that works out. I don't know what that looks like, but somehow that's got to, uh, yes, it says that. Yeah. yeah, but how that looks, I don't know. And yet we're made a little lower than the angels. But, yeah. Yeah, I guess. There's a lot of stuff like that where it's like, well, I don't know if I'm ultimately going to answer it, and I, I'll just tuck that away too. It won't matter in the end, but if, if I get an understanding of it, I'll pull it out and go, that's great. That's right. That's right. Amen. A whole lot sooner. Right? Right. Because life is a teacher that kills all its pupils. <laughs> it does. I'm sorry. Prove me wrong. <laughs> I know. Yes. It's, I think it's happy because, because I, th this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I kind of long for that. I really do, the release. Yeah, it is. Yep. So, yeah, and the only thing that brings meaning, love God and keep his commandments. Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, in talking about Revelation, because I'm one that I kind of just put it aside. Yeah. Because I think people get really... Not on my so, watch, but yes. Yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. this just becomes this I know the truth and yeah. you don't kind of thing. And I guess I just feel like um, we should be so, like you've been saying, humble about it. Yep. Even, even in talking to other people. Yep. You know, I mean, revelation is something that people that aren't believers will, will ask about. And they'll Absolutely. Ask about it. And it's something that they, it's like one more conspiracy thing. Like, what's this mean? Right. You know, so I feel like as a Christian, I don't get caught up into all of that because I, I don't believe that's what I need to be doing. I need right. to be praying for people and all those kinds of things. Right. So I think when you do talk to other people who aren't necessarily Christians about, you know, if they bring up revelation, I feel like you need to kind of have just that spirit of love and humility and 
Yep. And kindness about it yep. so that you're not you're not making it sound like, you know That's this. The end is near and you're Th- that's here. this right here. That's how to properly wait. To have charity in the midst of 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 brutality mm-hmm. is tough. But I think that's what the wait is. It's it's this is how you wait. And that there is an assurance of this. And somehow in the Western church, particularly in America, we think there's a way to love Jesus and embrace the world, and you just can't. You can enjoy things of the world. That's why I take the second interpretation of Ecclesiastes that we talked about in wisdom literature. I think that's what it's saying. It's like, look, God created stuff for you to enjoy, but don't make it what you worship, right? And, and, and that's, I think that's what Ecclesiastes is trying to say. Everything else is, by comparison, it's vapor, right? And I think that's exactly the approach you're talking about. It's funny how Scripture comes together and tells the same story. Isn't it amazing? Mm-hmm. Scripture holds together like that. Thousands of years difference between those two authors, and they, they, they're speaking the same story. Well, I think, you know, if you're, if you're really, you know, if you're talking to somebody that like that, you really need the Holy Spirit to help guide you to know what you can say that will... Like, move them into what the Bible is all about, what Jesus is all about. Yep. Yep. Yes. And, you know, the, 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 one of the things that you were, as you were sharing that the author points out is that John tells a story that it, it's going to look like the world is winning. You know, the church is losing. But that's not the whole story. You know, it's... It's Aslan saying, uh, there is a deeper truth. We're, we're, we're living according to a deeper truth, far deeper truth than the world has. It, it goes way beyond the stuff of the physical world. And it's a, it's a battle for what is real and what is, what is true. And it's going to look like the world's going to win that, but Jesus is going to come back and with a word of truth, all of the falsehoods will be dispelled. And you can go, I was right, see? <laughs> I told you. And it's never too late until it's too late. It's Yogi Berra kind of a saying, but um, I kind of really did want to end, end here on this note as far as looking at Revelation. If you have family members and friends who still say no to your, your belief system, that Jesus is your Lord and he's the, he's the way to salvation, don't give up. Don't give up. Pray for opportunities. And when they present themselves, walk through the door of opportunity. I, I've talked about my grandfather and grandmother. They both waited until their 80s to come to Christ. And they did. Genuine, genuine fruit in their lives at like 83 years old and they spent their entire life basically patting me on the head and say that's great for you tom but that's not what i believe yeah i prayed for my dad for 25 years and he shoved the lord on his deathbed yep i mean you just can't give up yeah if you missed the men's breakfast when this guy shared his testimony you missed out Uh (laughs) so thank you yep so don't give up. Don't relent. You, you, don't, you don't have to not say anything. You know, your family members who say, I just don't want you talking about that around me. Yeah. Really? You're telling me you don't want me to breathe. Is that what you're telling me? Because this is, this is like breathing. It's, it's, it's deeper than breathing for me. And it's, it means it's my, it's my core identity is that I am a child of God saved by grace through faith that no one can boast. Jesus' own family. His mother couldn't believe who he was until after the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say it again. God has no grandchildren. So there's no secondary belief. It's all primary. And so don't relent. And let me close us in prayer uh, before we do that. Next week, we're going to look at the appendix. We're going to talk about some, uh, some of your, your... You're the main content. I want you to think about... What is it that's really impacted you? What is it that you're carrying along with you that you're really tucked in your backpack? 
that you would share and encourage the rest of us. And I really would like it if everybody could take a chance to, to share. And if, if you don't like speaking in front of other people, just write it down and then read it. You know, if you're uncomfortable with sharing something or you want to make sure you get it right, just write it down and then we'll share it together. And, and I, I really want to talk about what has this book done in our lives? How has it moved the needle of, of being a, a follower of Christ? How has it deepened your faith? How has it challenged you? How is it, you know, like what's one of the main challenges it's given you in a good way? What's one of the Im impactful things? I don't know, is that, is that giving you enough fodder? Come up with two or three things. And then if no one's talking and you, you want to share all three things, great. But then also I will be handing out, and I would like you all to fill it out while we're here. Um, when, when we do this, or if we do this, this class again, I'd, I'd love to do it better than I did it this time. Because I, I think we have a lot of room for improvement. Uh, if we're not, we're fooling ourselves. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, w I just really want to hear from you. And it could be even, I uh, need to find a, somebody else to teach this class. It's okay. It's, okay. it's all right. Um, but I've really thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, I, I really want to hear from you so that the next class really can be sharpened. So let's pray together. Father, this has been a gift of an hour and a half together. I thank you that you give it to us weekly and that we might finish well next week. Thank you for this book of Revelation and how incredible it is, even though it's weird, and it, it, it is sharing such deep truths for us. Help us to endure until the end, whatever our end is, and that we would do it together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Hallelujah!